In the last video, I described how to obtain many copies of a desired cDNA using PCR. Now I'll describe how to incorporate that cDNA into a plasmid in preparation for stable insertion into E. coli. Plasmids are relatively small pieces of DNA found in microorganisms that are not part of the organism's genome. Bacterial plasmids are usually circular, double-stranded, and less than 10,000 base pairs in size. Multiple copies of a single plasmid can be present in a given bacterial cell. Plasmids are convenient vehicles, or vectors, on which a gene of interest can be inserted into bacteria. Some common features of bacterial plasmids are shown here. The plasmid must contain a replication origin, so that the plasmid can be copied and spread to both daughter cells when the cell divides. It is very helpful to have a selectable marker on the plasmid, which is a gene that allows you to distinguish between cells that have the plasmid from cells that do not. Often the selectable marker is a gene that confers resistance to an antibiotic. If the cells are grown in media containing that antibiotic, cells that don't have the plasmid will die, but cells containing the plasmid will survive. Many plasmids also contain a multiple cloning region, which is a section of DNA that contains recognition sequences for many restriction endonucleases, also called restriction enzymes. These can create double-strand breaks in the DNA. Each one of the entries on this list represents a different restriction endonuclease that can cut the DNA in this region. I want to take a few moments now and describe restriction endonucleases in a bit more detail. Different types of restriction endonucleases exist. In this course, we'll focus on the ones most commonly used, which are type 2 restriction endonucleases. These enzymes recognize a specific sequence on the DNA, usually 4, 6, or 8 bases in length. The enzymes make a double-stranded break in the DNA at a site within the recognition sequence. Recognition sites for restriction enzymes are usually palindromes. A palindromic DNA sequence reads the same on both strands in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Both sequences shown here are palindromes. For example, the complement to the sequence GAATTC is GAATTC. The sequence reads the same on both strands. Note that this is a bit different from how the word palindrome is used in language. These sequences are recognized by the enzymes ECOR1 and ECOR5. Restriction endonucleases are named after the organism that produces them and the order they were discovered. So, both of these enzymes were isolated from E. coli strain RY13, and they were the first and the fifth enzymes discovered in this organism. The red arrows indicate the points where the enzymes cut each DNA backbone. After both strands of DNA are cut by ECOR1, the ends of the DNA will look like this. Notice that because of the staggered nature of the cut sites, the 5' prime end extends beyond the 3' prime end of the DNA on each side of the newly created double strand break. These ends are referred to as 5' prime sticky ends. The four bases of the 5' prime overhang are available to base pair with a sticky end that is complementary. In contrast, the two cuts made by ECOR5 occur in the exact middle of the recognition sequence. This results in products with no overhangs, also called blunt ends. The discovery of restriction endonucleases was a huge jump forward for our ability to manipulate DNA. We have now discovered thousands of restriction enzymes that recognize over 200 distinct sequences, and this allows us to cut and paste DNA fragments together with great precision. Most plasmids used for cloning have been engineered to contain a multiple cloning site with many restriction endonuclease recognition sequences that enable us to cut open the circular DNA. We can then paste in an exogenous or foreign DNA that has compatible ends. The process is shown across the bottom of the screen. You cut both the plasmid and your DNA, such as the cDNA for your favorite gene, with restriction enzymes that match each other. In this case, we're using overhangs or sticky ends. Then you incubate the fragments together to allow the sticky ends to anneal to each other. 
Adding DNA ligase results in repair of the sugar phosphate backbone. Note that DNA ligase requires a 5' phosphate to be present in order to join two strands together. The result is an intact circular DNA that contains the desired insert. The product is called a recombinant DNA molecule because two pieces of DNA from different sources have been combined together. For example, suppose you wanted to use the BAMH1 cut site on a plasmid to insert the cDNA for your favorite gene. You could add a BAMH1 cut site onto the ends of the cDNA by ligating on short pieces of DNA that contain that sequence, called linker DNA. Or you could design your PCR primers to contain a BAMH1 recognition site, as I talked about in the section on site-directed mutagenesis in the last video. You cut the cDNA and your plasmid with BAMH1, giving rise to sticky ends that are compatible with each other. You purify these DNA fragments away from the restriction enzyme using gel electrophoresis. Then you mix the fragments together and add DNA ligase. The sticky ends can anneal to each other, allowing DNA ligase to seal the backbones. This gives rise to the desired recombinant plasmid. This plasmid is ready to be introduced into E. coli as I'll describe in the next video.